Uh, kia ora everybody. Welcome to the So Grow Thrive webinar series to empower farmers for financial success. My name is Kristen Kirkpatrick. I'm the Extension Manager for the Northern South Island. It's my privilege to be here tonight to kick off the six-part webinar series on behalf of the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Extension team. It's been a really great collaborative opportunity for our team. We've really heard um, and understand the current financial pressures everybody's facing. So we just wanted to provide an opportunity to reach far and wide with support and encouragement for getting through. So across the six webinars, you'll hear from many wonderful farmers, accountants, bankers and experts, providing you with insights and tools to grow and thrive. Please drop any questions that you have during the webinar into the Q&A bubble that you'll see on your toolbar at the bottom. Um, we will do our best to get them all answered uh, through this capacity. Um, this series will be accessible at the conclusion on the Beef and Lamb New Zealand website in the Knowledge Hub. The Knowledge Hub is full of wonderful relevant resources for you to access. If you're going to need any additional tech support, we've got our National Extension Program Manager, Olivia Weatherburn, on the call. You will find her with the username Tech Olivia. Um, this webinar has been recorded. I now invite you to sit back and enjoy as the paddock stories bouncing back from tough times, a farmer panel facilitated by VET, Farmer, Central South Island Farmer Councillor, and the whole story podcast extraordinaire, Bex Smith, takes you through it. Thanks, Bex. Well, kia ora koutou everyone, na mai hari mai, ko Bex Smith taka ingoa, and I am Bex Smith, I am a farmer in the Maniatoto Central Otago, I farm here with my husband and his family um, on a 700 hectare sheep, beef and deer property. Now, I feel a little bit like I should be on the other side of the um, conversation tonight actually sitting and listening because as a young farming couple going through farm succession, um, you know, times are tough at the moment, right? And I would really, I'm really looking forward to getting some advice from our panelists today. But my role is to host the panel this evening, um, facilitate the conversation, and ask some really helpful, I hope, um, questions of our panelists this evening. Um, so without further ado, let's introduce you to the panel because they're the ones who have the experience and wisdom and tales to share about. Yeah, bouncing back from, I guess, tough times, challenging times, um, and financial um, ups and downs. So, uh, without further ado, let's introduce you to Justine Kidd. And then, following on from Justine, we will have Matt Taylor and Patrick Horshaw. Now, the three of these people all have varying roles um, throughout or to do with beef and lamb over the years and currently. Um, they're spread out from over the countryside, and so I know that they'll provide a breadth of experience for you all. So welcome, Justine. Kia ora. Thank you, uh, Bex. It's really nice to be here. I'm here in my capacity as a general manager of the extension team across New Zealand. So that is all of our extension managers and coordinators across the country. I live in the Central Hawke's Bay, and... Um, in terms of farming, I'm I'm really here to bring, I guess, the real back paddock experience of uh, leading large scale dairy farms. Um, been I was involved in running corporate dairy businesses for 15 years, um, including through the uh, GFC and the three dollar ninety milk price, which was um, quite a big. Uh, extreme financial event uh, for for farming businesses when that happened. Um, so yeah, I've got uh, plenty of background in terms of navigating through those sorts of times, and I'm looking forward to sharing as well as hearing from both Matt and Pat because we can always um, there's always plenty to learn and things to trigger our um, inspiration. So um, current challenges in terms of things that are going on here is, sorry, my cat is going to annoy us. Um, current challenges is really uh, working with the team to be out there uh, supporting you, our farming community. So uh, this webinar is, as 
uh, Kristen said, a wonderful collaboration opportunity. Um, that is the first of uh, many that we'll be planning for you over the coming year. So really, uh, as Beck said, recognising and understanding the challenges that, um, I guess, the multifaceted uh, impacts of both inflation, uh, interest rates, and uh, all of the other impacts that we're faced with at the moment from cyclone weather uh, right through to regulation. So yeah, looking forward to sharing tonight. Thank you so much for that, Justine, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, next up, I would like to introduce Matt Taylor. So Matt, how are you going? And yeah, just tell us a bit about you, where you're from, and the current challenges you're facing. Yeah, uh, thanks, Max. Um, yeah, me and my wife, Shona, we farm down at Garston, Northern Southland, a couple of kids. And uh, to be honest, I'm probably a little bit surprised to be sitting on this side of the, the webinar. Um, when I owned up to Shona that I was one of the speakers, she was kind of, initially she said, look, we need to sit down and watch all six of these episodes and learn something. And, and then it was kind of like a, a, a what the fuck, are you one of the speakers? So um, I, I'm probably here just to reassure everyone that even if a, a, at a half of it like me can navigate stuff over the last 15 years, it's hope, hope for most people. Um, so uh, what? We, we, we're a high country place here, about 6,000 hectares. Um, we only use a few Angus cows and we try and finish as much as we can. But we also graze a few dairy cows and kill a lot of Frisian bulls just to, to make a bit of money and give us a bit of flexibility. So we're prepared to do what it takes to, to, to get through. Um, what I bring possibly tonight is I was lucky enough, I'm in my 40s, so I haven't seen the really tough times, but I've had a bit of a few tough times during the way through, and uh, I was lucky enough to do farms concession with that in about 2006. Um, so I've had the mortgage for 15 years, I suppose, and there's been a few ups and downs. And uh, when I reflect, oh, my philosophy is a little bit that adversity is a is a great learning experience, and something good always comes out of it. It, it never feels like that when when it's going against you, but um, I've always learned more when stuff's going wrong and there's a challenge in front of me. Um, so there's that aspect. And uh, recently, last year, we've done a fast session with Shona's parents. And we bought a little bit of extra land. So I'm in that that crowd of people with lots of debt and figuring out how to, how to cope with that when your, your interest bill doubles. Um, uh, and then probably the other bit, Tonight is um, the last 15 years we've been in a real growth kind of development phase here at Long Peak and we've, we've put 25,000 stock units on through lucerne and irrigation and fertiliser and what I'm struggling with a little bit at the moment is just changing my mindset from that, that growth phase to just a more of a survival phase. Um, so that's taking a bit to get my head around and I'm pretty, I'll admit that I get excited about the big picture stuff and we are heading and um, I'm lucky enough to have some, you know, we, we've changed our business from a father and son outfit. So dealing with adversity when it was just me and dad is quite different to our situation now where we've got six staff, I've got lots of family depending on me. So completely different conversations to what we had 10, 12 years ago. Um, yeah, so yeah, and, and look, I've, look I've, I've been through, you know, I'm probably here just to reassure people that uh, everyone's got stuff going on, or they're dealing with stuff, and it may look like someone's got it all sorted from the outside, but there's a lot of stuff going on under the surface just to keep your head above water, so um, I don't care, you know. The truck driver that comes up the driveway, he's got shit he's dealing with. Um, yeah, we've all got stuff to deal with, so yeah, it's just hopefully, yeah, that's probably what I bring, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Matt. And it, I, I just pic picture that duck on the surface of the water, you know, um, swimming along, you know, gracefully, but those feet underneath are paddling 
trying to keep up you know I think everybody's like that you know sometimes people can come across all serene and got it together but it, they're sort of peddling hard under the water to, to keep things afloat um yeah and so now shifting over to our last panelist this evening Pat welcome along and yeah let's hear a little bit about you and where you're from and um I guess what you bring to the discussion this evening and some current challenges perhaps that you might be facing. Oh, well, kia ora everyone. Thank you very much for having me along. And um, as the other panelists and Bex has pointed out as well, I think um, might be sharing my experiences, but um, yeah, without a doubt, I'll be learning, um, learning plenty as well. Uh, so my wife and I, as well, we farm with our two young girls in Hawke's Bay, Partoka. So we were, um, we've been flood ravaged um, in February. And so we've got a recovery process off the back of that. And we've been there since 2018. And so we've had the 2020 drought alongside COVID, um, TB outbreak. And um, yeah, had to manage through um, some pretty intense years. And along that journey, we've also had the beef and lamb New Zealand monitor farm um, process in our corner ultimately as it's happened as we navigated that and the governmental regulation changes and things like that so um, really embrace that uh, network of help and, and support that the rural community is really good with um, and it's been able to help our business through that period and I guess um, for us now, we've got a few different challenges around a rebuild um, of our farming system or our infrastructure, as well as um, what we've all seen and talked about is the inflation costs on farm. And given that we're five years into our farming journey of ownership, we've also got a lot of debt that is about to be refixed and being refixed. Um, and that's gone from something like 3.7% all the way up to 8 point, you name it, sort of percent. So... Um, yeah, a fair bit of pressure on the top side of that, and, and amongst that, I've also um, recently been elected on as the Beef and Lamb Eastern North Island Board Director, um, which is a fascinating insight and um, full of challenges, but full of opportunities and something that me, early in my farming career, um, I'm really embracing and looking forward to and um, enjoying the ability to contribute to that um, future that ultimately I've got to um, be a part of. So um, that's me. Oh, here you go. I'm talking and it's still muted. You see, even the facilitator can't work Zoom. Um, I just said thank you very much, Pat, and welcome to all of our panellists this evening. Um, so just to echo what Kristen said earlier, um, is use the Q&A bubble on your Zoom screen to ask questions. Um, I will go through some of the panel questions that I've prepared ahead of time um, and the Beef and Lamb team have contributed to, but also if we keep that fluid with those questions and answers popping into that function there, I'll try and keep an eye on those and make sure that I intersperse those into the panel discussion. Um, as we go through, I may not ask all of the questions to each of our panelists, um, just in the essence of time, but we will make sure that we get a good breadth of um, experience and background across these questions. So let's crack into it then. I'll see if I can pick a really tricky one to start with. Um, I think, Pat, you touched on there some of the challenges that you're seeing in the financial space um, at the moment and where they're going to impact you on farm. But I think if you were going to pick probably the biggest challenge you're seeing and, and that impact on the farm, what would you go with? Yeah, so like um, I think like obviously the biggest one on our as a percentage of gross farm revenue is the interest rate. Um, in that lease or leasing land arrangement between our company and our trust. Um, and so that puts a, a magnitude of pressure on and it's something that's outside of our control um, largely. Um, and so our ability to influence that is, is a lot less. Um, and so for me, it's something that I've, I have the conversation and I'm um, quite frank around what that looks like with our bank. And... Um, yeah, have, have had that conversation around not playing, paying the principal as, as previously contracted and taking a bit of a, a holiday, for want of a better word, over that side of things and um, doing interest only. But then, like I say, putting putting our focus and our energy back into those costs that we can control. Um, yeah, some 
fertilizer is probably the next biggest ticket on the um, as a percentage of GFR. So um, yeah, trying to work hard and, and find some efficiencies around all those sort of things. Um, freight's a big one for us um, with a trading component in in animal health um, with a lot of young stock. So. We're drilling into those quite heavily at the moment to find um, those one or two percent that we might, might be able to shift out of that. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point, right? It's those one or two percent. Like if you can make a big ticket win, that's awesome. But all of those one and two percent add up too. So going line by line item from biggest to smallest is, and just see if you can pick up those small wins along the way. It's amazing, you know, just the changes you can see with picking up a few of those smaller um scale impacts right yeah for sure i mean that's one of my um one of my points i guess is is around those one and two percent um the accumulative effect of shifting those a little bit down on your expense side and shifting a few up on the on the revenue side it, it creates quite a meaningful impact when you accumulate them together yeah, thanks for that. And what about you, Matt? If you were looking at the financial space on your farm, um, what are some of those, you know, and maybe the top three challenges you're seeing in the financial space on the farm at the moment? And where where exactly are they going to impact the most? Matt, unmute you're yourself. Unmute. Sorry. Yeah, so, I, um, so I'm probably coming from a slightly different point of view here in that, we come out of quite a dry year last year, and in my experience, it's it's a bit like you use, if you pinch them in a dry year, you tend to pay for the next year and your lambing percentage and you don't get lambs away off farm. And in a financial sense, we kind of got through last year okay, but we were dry, we used up a lot of working capital, and now we're in the second year, and, and that's, that's where I'm really finding it starting to bite, is that we, you know, I probably didn't monitor it as as well as what I could have, and I, I had some trigger points where I wanted to get my, my current account to uh, last year, but it just kind of creeps up on you. And now in the second year, it's it's you know it's making it pretty tight now, which you know I, I, I'm assuming, but I'm guessing um, guys in North Island that are coming, they spent a lot of money last year dealing with the, the cyclone uh, revenue run back there, so they're probably in a pretty similar situation. Um, so that's just being pretty, really cognizant of how to manage working capital. Because we 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 can go from a, a zero balance on our current account in three months over November. This, this is the wicked problem we've got in the South Island, the Southern South Island. Is about twelve percent of my budget gets spent on winter crop and pasture and mule through November, December, January. So I can go from zero balance on my current account. Uh, First of October, which is one of my trigger points. Um, three months later, I've, I've spent four hundred thousand more each month than what I've earned. So it just balloons if I don't manage it. Um, so there's that side of it. Um, possibly what I'm, I'm I'm struggling a little bit with at the moment is just wage expectations. Like um, I like to to really look after my staff, but there's expect They've, you know, they've got cost of living pressures there too, and uh, I'd like to think we pay above average, but I'll, you know, I, 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 it, it's really tricky when you've got inflation of seven, eight percent, and you've got wage increases through public service and people living in town getting ten to twelve percent. Um, so, and 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 dealing with. The financial pressure at the moment. Staff are my biggest asset, so it's trying to keep them on side and get them to buy into this all, and just so that's that's really challenging. That part of it is just managing that expectation there. Um, so that's probably my. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to and see what Justine needs. Yeah, oh, that's great. Thank you, Matt. And um, yeah, I think I can echo that situation where it is tough down here, and well. It's tough everywhere, everywhere, but that um, cash flow situation when you're setting up for winter crops um, at the moment with no revenue coming until um, lambs are weaned in December, it creates a, a, a sort of a cash flow pinch in the sheep and beef world, doesn't it? Um, Justine, to fire to you then, um, 
both Pat and Matt have touched on speaking to some key people there. And I think really important to come to you then and go, you know, having been through what you've been through in the dairy sector and then hearing what Pat and Matt have just offered up there, what are the important conversations to be having around finances in times like this and who with? Thanks, Bex. Yeah, I was thinking that that would be a good segue. Um, one of the things, I guess, it, it's really important just to get a team around you. So like when we, well, it was before we hit the $3.90 milk price, because when that happened, we had a really quite a good forecast going into that year. And then it just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. Um, so I'd already gone out and actually talked to the most successful lowest cost farmers that I knew um, around you know, how do you navigate these businesses through, um, you know, what what was probably looming at us. So I think that's that's really important, like is who is your team and whether that's people that you've got on farm, your family, your neighbours, um, other farmers that you know, you know, uh, professionals, whether they're consultants or um, like your, your bank managers, um, getting in and around them. And a couple of the learnings that were triggered just with what Pat and Matt said was um, those guys said to me don't waste a good crisis um, and at the time you sort of look at that but it's actually a you know it's a tough time and it's also a really good time to focus on the things that Pat was talking about like where can you get the one and two percent savings we we can get the one and two percent uplifts in your production because when you get out the other side you can still hold on to those things and then really grow your profitability quickly um and and that's that's the that's what you've got to hold on to um the other big thing that those guys talked about was delay defer and ditch so that we, you know when you're going through um that budget with your bank manager or your accountant or you know another farmer really really looking at um, both the short and the more medium term implications of not doing it just yet um, ditching it completely um, or finding some deferral arrangements minding um, Matt's point about working capital you know you like you'll find over the next little while um, a lot of your suppliers will offer deferred arrangements, which can be really helpful, but you do need to really be disciplined around looking at your cash, you know, your cash flow so that you're not um, just, cre you know, shifting it, um, basically just shifting the problem a couple of months so that actually you're shifting that problem into a period of higher cash flow for you. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it just you take your bank managers do not like just get in and around them like like Pat has done straight away that's probably the most important conversation you can have and then you know go find some people that you trust to really open up your numbers and look at your your farming system and your numbers with and don't underestimate the power of um, the team that you have around you on farm whether the people you employ or contractors and the good ideas that they will have if you involve them and how can we do this better how can we do this for less um, yeah so talk it's important to talk yeah can I can I add something yeah. onto the back of that, Bex? Um, yeah, just go in for terms it. of, uh, I'll give my perspective of my um, conversation and network at the moment. And so um, I've got a mentor, for want of a better word, but like I, I'm quite open with that. That is a mentorship that I, I use them for, um, and that's somebody that I worked for during university. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll flesh out our open our accounts to him and, and work through our budgets with him. The other one is our discussion group. And so there's a lot of, um, we put a deliberate time aside in our discussion group to assess financials for the visiting farm, but obviously we display everyone else's at the same time. So you get that ability to benchmark and say, well, hang on a minute, why is my animal health $3 a stock unit higher than a similar system that, sh that should be quite comparable? Um, and then you can talk about some of those intricacies just around, I don't know, what, what the drench regime might be. And so whether there's some differences there, um, and then the other one to that is um, going through the monitor farm program. Obviously, we had a committee steering that for the for beef and lamb, and so in, and for us in our business. And so there's that network and that communication. Some people will use that as an advisory group or whatever it might be. 
um, and our accountant and banker are the other two that, um, yeah, we'll, we'll open those conversations up. And open them up early is probably puts you in the driving seat so much earlier on as well um, because you get, get the ability to start taking control before it's further down the path. Thanks heaps for that, Pat. I think um, what I took out of both of your answers there actually was the real the importance of openness and transparency um, in these sorts of times. And I think it's contrary to what's kind of a natural response, which is to kind of go inward and insular and become quite self-focused. But I think it's really important to be mindful that actually sometimes by focusing our attention on speaking to people, being open about our experience, being transparent about the tough times, um, joining discussion groups and being involved with monitor farms is actually providing an opportunity to, with that openness and transparency, to learn from others and invite others to kind of give insights into your farming business. And by talking about it out loud to sometimes come up with some insights yourself. Um, so I think that's a really key point because it's actually quite challenging at the moment to do because when times are tough, sometimes you just want to um, knuckle down and get outside and get on with the work because, hey, let's face it, it's springtime and times are busy, but you do need to spend some of that time in that strategic mindset um, space. So I think we've actually got a question that's popped up and I think it's a good time to um, touch on it going back to Matt. We've got a question in the Q&A about can we get Matt to explain more about his trigger points? And I had that further down the agenda, but let's dive into it now, Matt. So what are those trigger points that kind of um, you look for in your farming budget or financial year? Yeah, okay. Um, oh, look, um, if you talk to my accountant or bank manager, they, I'm the, the cautionary tale here. I'm, I'm pretty lax, but I'm getting better. Okay, so a lot of my triggers in that business are, are feed and climate related. I mean, they kind of, they coincide with kind of when I, I go back and revisit my budget now. So um, when we get to spring, we do a, a bit of a stock take on how heavy bulls are and how we stand and, and then that reinforms my budget. And then I've got triggers on just how much, I, you know, I've got a reasonably accurate forecast on how much working capital I need to get through to January. Um, and then once I get to tailing, then, you know, I've, like the last year I learned not to count chickens, chickens before they hatched because we, we scanned well and we got three days of snow and there went, uh, you know, another 15% of our lambs disappeared. So um, my triggers, yeah, my, yeah, so I, I it's hard to put it in, but I've got I've got triggers in our business on what our what our margin ahead needs to be. Um, I've I've got a reasonably good idea on how much it costs us to grow to feed through spring and through winter. Um, so then I can tie that back to how much margin ahead or how much margin per kilo dry matter we need to make to make that that enterprise viable. Um, and then. The way we've structured our business, we've got lots of flexibility in what stock enterprise we do. So um, if there's no money in winter trade lambs, we'll go and do cold cows. If there's no money there, we'll go and do fruit and bulbs. Uh, if there's more money in prime, we go and do them, or else we're just going to put more use on. So um, trigger points are only any use if you've got a plan B, C, and D to, to you know, but, a trigger point is really useful to recognise a problem, but you've, you know, you've also got yeah that plan. What's that flexibility in the system to to deal with that problem once you recognise it's there? Um, yeah. So one of my key ones is probably the first of October. I like to have nothing sitting on my current account. Um, otherwise, uh, I don't want to be the guy that this wasn't me, but this I've got a brother who used to be a banker. And he got a phone call from a client who couldn't put his boat up on Christmas Eve. You know, you don't want to be that guy that, um, over Christmas. Just, you know. So just some of those trigger points there, just to install some confidence in your banker that you can, managing your work capital, I think that's really key. Um, if you do need a temporary limit increase, well, and you So some of that trigger, and first of October, I can kind of look through now and say, to a banker, well, look, this is where my cash flow is tracking, and um, January we're going to be looking for a DRI potentially just to get us through a couple of months, um, and how long and how much. 
Um, and again, in the autumn is probably another key point because that's that's really setting us up for the, the following year. But I haven't. Yeah, look, I'm probably the worst person to ask about financial triggers. So, so yeah. Well, let's throw it out there to the other panelists then. Kat, what are your financial triggers? Yeah, I'm, I'd probably emulate Matt's words a fair bit in terms of I've got a lot of triggers around what my farm system can handle. And so um, that's ultimately what I can control. And so I'll, uh, I use Farmax as a modeling software um, because of our trade component. And, we, and I marry that with um, our soil moisture and soil temperature from Climate Station just nearby. And so that tells me when, when my opportunity is in the marketplace to, to be buying or, or when I need to start getting my exits lined up at the other end of the trade um, and those sort of things. But um, from a financial perspective, I've, um, it's probably, it's not necessarily a trigger for me. I don't ever have, have certain places I, I want to get through to through, through a financial year from a cash perspective, but I do I do monitor that. And so like um, every month when I'm doing the 20th, I'll be reviewing how we're tracking and, and same to Matt's point. Um, in the grand scheme of things, um, as a farmer, we're typically, and it, and it depends on your situation, but you you typically got a lot of asset behind you, a lot of horsepower. Um, and so that, that's short grab for a bit of um, operating um, yeah, working capital is, is quite insignificant from the overall business. And um, and having that conversation with our banker, he's the first one that will tell us um, he doesn't want us farming to our bank account. He wants us farming to our production potential. Um, and so if we're constrained by cash, here's the cash, go and make the trade happen, go and make the money out of the back of the trade. Um, nothing worse than being like, oh, I don't have the money for that, so I won't do the trade and I forego the opportunity of 30K out of that trade. So um, with reviewing that monthly and being aware of what my um, trades are lined up in front um, or cash project projections and where I'm going to have to spend like you've just got to you got to yeah have that conversation and know know that you can have capacity to execute what your production system or the farming business in our situation um, the land asset and resource is going to be able to provide us to, to harvest the money out of that yeah excellent I really love that perspective and I think um, segueing off that then um, this is to discuss with all of you is actually around that budgets and reforecasting. Um, you mentioned there, Pat, are you you're on a monthly um, review of budgets and forecasting? Was that? Yeah, I'll, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, every at the twenty years, obviously paying them. Um, that's my opportunity to jump in, look at what's what's around me in terms of information. Um, I'm quite an avid sort of reader of of key pieces of um, market information um, to, to sort of build out my picture. Um, but it's all orientated around the things that I can control. And then it's probably every two or three months that I'll actually, um, I'll, yeah, I'll go and um, adjust up or down or whatever it might be that I need to, to really map that through. The, the, the initial part of that might just be a little bit of a gut feel or, or if there's something blatantly obvious, you just got to go and address that. But um, some of those monthly ones are just a bit of a gut feel of saying, oh, we've got to be cautious about how far we're tracking up on land price or whatever it might be. Um, and then, yeah, if, if more meaningful information comes to comes to light, then addressing it very directly because um, I don't like the surprise of being caught out, hence why I'd, I'd like to review it quite often. Yeah. And what about you and your experience, Justine? Like, what have you found as a, yeah. especially in times like this, how yep. often should people be reviewing the their numbers. budgets? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm in a the bit numbers. of a stickler. I'm a bit of a stickler, really. Um, so I get, yeah, I think business disciplines are always a really good idea, and you learn how valuable they are, you know, in tough times. And then if you can keep them going when times get easier, um, you know, like I said earlier, that's when you realise how much you can actually. Um, leverage your margins and you know so so move quicker you know pay off more debt you know whatever it is so I was always um and I still am the team's learning that um a monthly you know mo monthly budget review definitely or and um always had like a plan for the year and I think what Matt was talking about before and Pat 
Um, I used to try and look at it from effectively how much income, you know, did I need to make? So in dairy, it's a much, you know, it's a simpler equation, um, you know, in terms of working out your break-even milk price. But I think in, you know, in our more mixed um, uh, mixed farms that if you can understand what your revenue line needs to be and then those trigger points, you can start to set them around some of those critical um, um, activities that influence that income line um, so that you can track, you know, am I am I heading to be better for my gross income or am I heading to be away from my gross income target that I need? Um, and though is that if you're doing that monthly, that's when you can act quickly. And, you know, it's the same, I always think it's the same as when you're going into a drought, the sooner you recognize it and the sooner you make small decisions, the smaller the decisions are that you have to keep making. If you don't make early decisions, you end up having to make a really big one. Um, and, you know, and that big decision has a lot more consequence. Um, and I always, I always say to people, just make a decision, just make a small decision because you can always make another one, you know, you don't don't wait to try and make the perfect decision just make one take some action um and then you know in a few days a few weeks or a month um you know look back make another one um and i think that's the same with the budgeting it's like have a really good plan you know that the plan is not going to happen how it's going to happen but if you don't have the plan you don't know how far ahead or behind you're tracking so that's when you can lose time um, around making those early decisions and an early decision it's always smaller and it's always easier yeah so that would be um my big learning um but yeah every month absolutely <laughs> yep and for completeness, what about you, Matt? How often are you um, revising the budget? Or, you know, I, I should say monthly, but I'm probably more of a, where I've come from, uh, you know, being a father and sunny up, but a lot of it was up in my head. And I, we could get away with that for so long. Um, but I've been in a situation where I just got scared of looking at my bank account and I didn't look at it for six weeks and then you're in the shit. And um, I've learned from those mistakes. I've been there. I've done that. Um, and then I've had a, a manager come on recently, and he used to work for a farmer that you know I really respect. And he, you know, he said he knew exactly how much money was in his bank account every night. Um, he knew where he was tracking. And uh, you know, I think to, to Justine's point, you know, we're we're a creature of habits, and we can change our habits and behaviours. And and that, um, you know, every week now. Well, every two or three days, I'm looking at my bank account. Uh, focus is, you know, the, my working plans and focus, and uh, that's that's a great. That makes it so simple to budget, and you're you're looking at that every week now. Um, but as for a, a real, you know, so so that's my seeing where we're tracking. I'm not scared of it now. Um, I'm 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 trying to make those early decisions, but I'm just saying I I I, I can sympathise with our guys can stick the head in the ground. I've been there, I've done that, and it, it never plays out well. Um, as for the I think I'm... Eh? Sorry, Matt, I think sometimes uh, if you don't get the numbers out onto paper, your head can make them bigger um, yep. or smaller, you know, and so when you get them out, like you're saying, and you actually look at them on paper, um, yeah, it, it actually makes it easier to see what you need to do. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you start um, catastrophizing it a little bit, and mm. and your mind can't move on from the you know your mind's running over shit what if what if and once you get on the paper it's never quite as bad as what it looks um, and at least then you've got a plan and you can follow through and instead of devoting all your thought to running over those numbers again and again you've actually got a path forward and you know um, you know the actions an action causes greater consequences than action so don't be afraid of doing something doing nothing is far far worse um i've been there it's, i'm just, just yeah um so yeah that but yeah as for the the, the real going into the numbers and reforecasting i'm, I'm a bit like pat i subscribe to agri hq so when the outlook comes out out should i i go through we do a stock take through farm iq what lands we've got on 
uh, where they're tracking weight wise, use every HQ forecast. I make sure I talk to my, my meat company, and um, we've got a really good relationship with them now. So we get a lot of, they're there, we own the company, just use them. And mm. the more you talk to them, the more insight you'll get. Um, so I'm probably more on a, a, you know, every three monthly cycle, I really try to re forecast. And then, and then that helps because I've, we've changed our spending pattern a little bit. So now I've, I'm becoming more of an autumn spender. So, you know, before we do that autumn spend in March, I really go through that budget. There's only four months left to run. I know how much money I can spend on fur to a bit of R&M and, um, yeah. So that's, I kind of tie it in with, with uh, big revenue periods and when the money's really going out, getting good price information coming back in. That makes sense. Yeah, and I think that perspective is just so valuable um, because I think, as you say, it's once you get things out and you start to look at them, you know, the idea of your temporary limit increase or your TLI um, sometimes can be quite daunting. It can seem like quite a big figure, but when you start to look at perhaps your asset base you've got behind you, Pat, or actually just the gross farm revenue that you've got coming in for the year, it actually can be quite a small percentage of that. So it's not as daunting. And I think once you start to put that into perspective, you go, yeah, I need this to help me with a working capital. But um, actually in the grand scheme of things, that's not the end of the world and um, yeah being just really open and to talk to your bank manager about that now I think probably a question that I didn't have down and hasn't come up yet but let's take it right back let's go back to the basics of actually budgeting and if you're not comfortable budgeting and you haven't done a lot of it in the past and you're inspired by this conversation and you want to start um, getting into more regular budgeting and I highly recommend you do obviously at the moment we've got um, three key advocates for it here on the call on the panel but how would you get started at building that skill set and developing that budgeting muscle Justine you can probably start with that you look like you've got some Good yeah. There. I yeah. Well, I think like your bank manager, your accountant, and a good friendly neighbour that you trust are really good places to start. Um, even if you don't, you know, there's some really good like the farm. You know, the farm financial software now is you know is really good. It's easy yeah. to use. It's really accessible. Um, but it doesn't need to you know a pen and paper or a spreadsheet or whatever you're comfortable with is actually you know just you know it, it's good it's fine it's good so I think asking asking someone there's you know really good resources on the beef and lamb knowledge hub that can help with this but asking asking someone to help just get a you know like a, a template effectively you know going through that process of um of how you yeah how you structure it where to go to get your existing numbers um, so that you've got a starting point. Once you've got a starting point, it becomes, re you know, quite easy. Uh, you can because you can look at say, oh, that's how much I spent on my fertilizer last year. What did I buy? Am I going to do the same amount of cropping? Have I got the same amount of new grass? Am I going to use more or less? So um, yeah. So once you've got that that base point, which you can pull out of your history, it becomes a you know a lot easier and a lot quicker. But I think, you know, bank manager and a trusted farmer, um, farming friend would be a perfectly great place to start. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Pat? What was your journey into really grappling down with those financials and starting budgeting? Like, what advice would you have to someone who's just starting on that journey? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess where I um, I build mine is in farm focus or cash focus, um, uh, what used to be cash manager. Um, and obviously, yeah, most, I imagine most farming businesses are running those accounting softwares um, or or the accountant is or, or whatever it might be. And so a little, exactly what Justine said, like um, I think there's a bit of, a bit of owning your own numbers Um so like um, nothing wrong with having a having a crack at it and it um, in in taking a little bit of ownership of that and because that's a lot of what's in your own mind and um, and I do believe in the fact that if you've if you're setting this plan up um, you're bought it, you're bought into it and so there's a lot more ability to execute on that whereas if um, 
yeah, if, if you go to somebody else without much of an idea, a um, little bit to Justine's point, like you knew what you spent on fertilizer last year, like start working with some of those numbers um, and, and have that in mind as opposed to going to somebody and say, well, they, they'll probably give you a budget back um, if you don't have too much directive over that. And owning those numbers is probably quite a benefit, I'd say, as a side note. Um, but a key word there is also trust in um, a little bit to what we were speaking about earlier around your network and, and um, those trusted advisors. Like um, trust is a big part of um, capturing valuable information and, and putting it to good use. Um, but also that transparency with you being willing to share your current realities and, and getting honest feedback um, because, yeah, nothing worse than not getting honest feedback and um, needing the trust to be able to do that. Yeah, that's really valuable. What are you, about you, Matt, any tips or tricks for people just getting started on that sort of budgeting and forecasting journey? Yeah, uh, it, just keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, look, the, I never used to do much of a budget because I'm a bit of a perfectionist and if I couldn't do it, Dead right, it was kind of I just procrastinated, put it off, put it off. Um, but I think we all do a form of budgeting in our heads. It's just putting it on the paper, um, and even if it's just as simple as rolling your expenses forward and and um, really playing with that top the revenue numbers and what your you know your productions forecast for, and um, just plugging a few numbers in from what your your meat meat drafter is telling you forecasting forward because that's probably where most of your ability is going to come from is in that that revenue line um, and then you can probably pick through your your expenses the um, most of the it, generally I'm, I'm generalizing here but 80 90 percent of your, your expenses unless you're doing something really different on the animal health side or you're going to employ an extra person a lot of that variability on the on the expense side is going to come through an r and m and any you know gen, just general fertilizer price fluctuations and um, I think that's what's made it quite tricky the last two years is a lot of the air chem and fertilizer it, it's just it's you know I want to contradict myself here and that the last two years those expense numbers have just fluctuated so wildly and and, and probably that, that that old approach of having a really good look at your, your revenue numbers and that, that would suffice, the last two years, the, the expense numbers have just gone all over the place. So, but, you know, just keep it simple for a start. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and uh, probably a bit to Pat's point, your, your trusted advisors around you, just if they haven't got your back and got your best interest at heart, perhaps you need other trusted advisors. Um, so if you've surrounded yourself with the right people, they're going to help you through this process and make it easy. Um, you just got to reach out. and um, but, but they can only be there to help if they've got a really clear idea of what's important to you. So one of the most important things me and Shona did was doing a, an AWDT, AWDT course. We went down and we had to actually sit down and write down a vision and a set of values for our business. Um, so, you know, that that means when we're if you've got a half-assed budget that you've done and you go to your accountant, if he knows where you think your business is heading or what your vision or your purpose is and your values, what's really important to you know what's what behaviours are really important to you as a couple. Well, even if it is a half-assed budget, they can they're going to help be able to help flesh it out for you. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a bit of you know to Pat's point, owning your numbers. You can only own your numbers if you're really clear on what your purpose is and what values are important to you. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really important bringing it back to your value set. But I think also touching on something that you've all discussed there is actually the people around you. And we've had some questions pop up in the Q and A section. And the first one I'd like to discuss is how you all look after your staff um, other than pay increases. So if our people are our greatest asset on farm, you know, but they obviously there are large financial costs involved and time required with training and um, employing people. How do we make sure we look after our people during tough financial times to 
keep them involved with our farming business and make sure that they can help us succeed and thrive. And I'm probably going to throw this one to Justine first, as I know this is definitely in your wheelhouse. Mm, yeah. Um, I So I think it's remembering that when it comes to people, the little things are the big things. Um, and so, you know, Matt, Matt is right. It's really tough when you're in tough times and inflation's going up. You know, you, you can't just keep rising uh yeah increasing wages but there's all sorts of things that you you can do um you can you know look at that sometimes well we we used to go out to our team and ask them just ask them what is important what is important to you what can we do um what you know what is going to be valuable and sometimes it's really um simple things you know like different sorts of wet weather gear um it might be uh you know collectively you could all be uh, contributing to growing a vegetable garden um it might be can we have access to you know to more meat so sometimes there are some things that you you can do um that are actually really helpful and they don't necessarily cost you very much at all um your time is probably the biggest thing that you can give to people in your business you know during tough times so like Matt said, they're going to be doing it hard as well, you know, checking in on how they're getting on with their, um, with their household budget or if, if they're a young couple that are trying to put together something, you know, how are they going with their, with their own goals? Can you help them with any of that? Um, offering to babysit for them while they, you know, have a, have a night um, eating fish and chips somewhere, you know, it doesn't, just anything that shows um, a level of genuine care. So yeah, definitely get away from the, um, you know, get away from the sense that you have to try and match, um, you know, wage increases and invest, invest time and creativity. Um, we also, we went to the team and we're really clear about um, really care with them about what you know three dollar ninety milk price meant for the business, and then we sort of all set ourselves goals about what we could do. So you know, I I went and found fifty cents of savings, and you know looked at different so I, things that I could control. I went and did, and our teams they did the same thing on their farms, and they came up with a um, with this little mantra, which was um, reuse, recycle, and repurpose, and then they. They set themselves like little between farm competitions about who could, um, you know, save the most money by going and finding or reusing or repurposing the most things. Um, and it was actually amazing. Like one guy found over $3,000 worth of stuff. I mean, it was a big farm, but of stuff from fencing reels to, you know, to standards to, um, you know, hoof blocks that could be re-glued on other cows, um, all sorts of things. So sometimes, you know, people, they surprise you with their own creativity. So be quite open with them about what you're trying to do. Um, and and they will come on that journey with you. You know, if they, if they understand, um, yeah, you'll find that they'll really get in behind you and you'll be surprised what they can contribute. Yeah, so those would be my, my two big things. Yeah, and I think that's probably segues nicely into a really important point as well is that you can't actually serve from an empty cup so it's really important that we look after ourselves through all of this as well and so it'd be really interesting actually to hear from you perhaps Pat and Matt um, how you manage stress levels to avoid getting isolated insular um, and actually look after your own well-being probably both physical and mental during challenging periods to be able to actually lead um, not only a team, but also, you know, a substantial business. Yeah, I can go first there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, having come through in probably COVID-19 and the drought was probably a real kickstart to finding some tangible techniques around managing those pressures and that uh, the stress of um, of that, yeah, the business pressure related to that. And yeah. Um, I'm uh, living and breathing it right now, actually. Uh, so I go and play hockey on the um, uh, train on the Thursday, play on the weekend. Um, and I'm actually at National Men's Tournament at the moment. Um, but, like, for me, it's going and taking myself 
um, not just physically my body, but also my mind completely out of the business. And um, you go and have conversations and um, with people with completely different walks of life. So you start understanding some of those um, living costs um, uh, that they have to experience and some of their challenges. And you're also having conversations with um, people that are in growth um, phases in their business. And so like it can help bring my mind out of a survival sort of state of my business and, and sort of see some of those bigger pictures that they're looking at and, and try and uplift my own um, perspective. And the other side to that is obviously it's a, it's a physical outlet as well, um, running around the hobby turf and being physical and doing a bit of the hand-eye, um, all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's a big one for me. Um, and, yeah, live and breathe it. So. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Yeah, um, I'm probably going to relate a bit of a story back uh, in 2008. Um, I think I'd taken over in 2007, and you know, we'd, we were still stock property back then. We sold lambs for $90. Life was good, 11% had come up. Next year we got dry, we gave lambs away $50, $60. Um, it was pretty tight, and um, the store lamb sale that you always have a few bears after you store them sale and I had a, a stock agent said to me, shit, what are, you, what are you doing farming this place? It's it's not the easiest place to farm. Uh, why don't you sell it up and go somewhere else? Um, so so oh, I kind of see, I, I, if you ever get a chance to watch Michael Jordan's last dance, he'd pick up on little things that people said to him and that would be his motivation going forward. Um, so you know, that, that, that stock agent said that to me, and I went and stewed over that for a while, and I was probably in a pretty dark place, to be fair. Um, things weren't going very well, and, you know, that was probably the first, I didn't see, you know, I probably saw my stock agent then because I had to. It was a store lamb sale. Um, saw my TFO because we had to put beat in. That was probably, you know, that was before Shona come along, so I didn't see many people. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of recognised now where I was at then, and that's that's why we tried to get an advisory board around me. Um, you know, I make an effort to to connect with my discussion group and um, all these kind of people. So so sometimes you can kind of almost manufacture a bit of motivation. Like that stock agent, I just went out there. I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, whereas you know, when we split things up, the the accountant we had said to Dad, "Shit, this is a really bad idea. You signing stuff over to Matthew and putting the mortgage in his name." That's you know, shit, that's not going to work. And it was like, no, well, buggy, buggy, I'm going to, um, you know. So, you know, if you have to manufacture it, but people will say stuff to you, and whether it's reverse psychology, I don't know whether people are that clever or whether they just don't think it through, I don't know. But, um, so that's, that's a bit of how I get through a little bit. Um, but, you know, probably just day to day, I, I get a lot out of um, Fiber Gate. You go down, talk some shit, drink some beer, talk to people who don't farm, but like Pat, they've got different challenges and, you know, the, the, the act of volunteering or giving your time to someone else is quite rewarding. Um, so be it that or, you know, Farmer Council has been great because, you, you know, it's an act of giving back and, you know, positive like-minded people. Um, but a simple thing, if I'm feeling a bit down, I, I load the kids into the truck on a on a Sunday and we go for a drive around the farm and just um, uh, just reflect and just appreciate where we've got to and um, I don't we I I'm, I'm not a I'm not a celebrate the small the wins type guy that's more Shona um, but so that's something I'm learning I'm, I'm, yeah I'm probably on the other side but you know people say take a helicopter view of your business but we're lucky we can I can take the kids to the top of the hill and we look down on half the farm and and that's a bloody cheap helicopter ride. Um, and you just just take a bit of time to reflect, I think. Yeah. yeah. And especially, you know, you take the kids and I don't know what that's one of our about. You know, we're, we're in it to leave a legacy for the kids and set them up for life. So that just, um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when I say setting it up for the kids, it's, um, I think the financial stuff, is what well, I'm trying to think of Henry Ford saying a business that's cash rich is a really poor business. So 
from a farming point of view, if if we make a lot of money, but I I haven't done stuff with my kids and got the work ethic that can values in my kids, it's a pretty poor business. So um, yeah, so that's that's me. Yeah. No, that's awesome and such a great perspective, Matt. And I think I was um, looking at something on Instagram and shared it along actually the other day um, from Storm Buns, Brian, and she put up about, you know, what are the things you should do to sort of, what does self-care really look like? And I think it was, you know, making sure you eat well, you sleep well, you move your body and you connect with people. And I think you've all touched on those sorts of things there where, um, you know, putting in those key things in place to make sure you're looking after yourself and then you can look after your team. Um, so I'm mindful that it is past 8.30, but it wouldn't be like any panel facilitated by Bex without a little bit of optimism and inspiration at the end, anyone who's listened to any of my stuff before. Um, so I think I'd like to touch on briefly with each of you, I'd like sort of one key point that our audience can take away to, uh, what was the phrase that you used there? to find opportunity in times of chaos. I think in all of the challenge ahead of us, what is a key point that people can take away to find the opportunities during this time period? I'll start perhaps with you, Pat. Cool. Um, yeah, I think like a big one for me is um, our business, when it, um, speaking to um, Matt's process through the AWTT, like identifying our values. One of our values is to hold and engage in meaningful relationships for our business and I guess at this time in the pressures that we are under um, we're being realistic around trying to trying to work with those relationships and having some realities in that conversation um, and sharing our burden with them um, because those relationships with um, and I will speak directly about meat companies and, um, and our banker and our accountant and our service providers with um, agronomy and things like that like they're all parts of our business that are under pressure and, and being asked more of and um, and so I guess um, I'm saying that I've been very loyal to you I need a bit of um, bit of something to come back and some of them are no's and, and that's fine um, but then some of them do shift the dial a little bit and that little bit helps so um, I think as farmers we, we are relationship people and we've got um, quite meaningful connections with um, those people in our business. Um, and it's a time to yeah, have that conversation and um, see if there's just a little bit to gain from it because, um, yeah, certainly when the times are good, we're, we're happy to be there with them as well. Yeah, finding the opportunity and connection. Awesome. What about you, Justine? What opportunities should people be taking advantage of? Unmute. My screen moved quickly. Um, I really go back to, you know, never waste a good crisis, which a mentor of mine said. And I think it's remembering that we're going, we're in a tough time. We're going into a tough time, but it will pass, you know, like we're going to go through it. And the, the more you can, um, in some ways embrace it get into it you know the disciplines that we've talked about about planning and um, budgeting you know it all sets you up to come out the other side and be the fast mover and I think that um, you know there's that sort of the inspiration that I, I always hold when I'm going into these periods is you're not going to be here forever so use the opportunity to you know set yourself up to come out the other side and and move whatever that move is you know talking like with both Pat and Matt have talked about knowing what's important to you, knowing your purpose, you know, like the opportunity is going to be a fast moving, you know, be the fast mover on the other side. Yeah. Wonderful. And with the last word of the panel this evening, Matt, what about you? What opportunities should people be looking for in times of chaos or times of crisis? Yeah, you're probably looking for something really profound, but... Um... It's probably, I'm going to come back to, I know we've talked about budget and all this stuff. Um, I'm, having been there and done that, I'm, I'm really mindful of your mindset. And, um, you know, there's a saying that whether you think you can or can't do something, either way, you're already right. So, you know, if you, you know, I, I love a good saying. So 
you know, another one is a, a pessimist sees the opportunity, uh, the difficulty in every opportunity, and a, a, an optimist sees the opportunity in every challenge. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually feeling quite energised at the moment that this is a is, is kind of a real reset for our business, and um, we've we've got a bit lazy the last couple of three years, and a bit of fat's crept in, and um, yeah, it's it's taken me probably six months to to rise to the challenge. There's been a bit of a grieving process there where you kind of, I've been in denial and then, uh, you know, you look around who you can blame and then it's like, well, no shit. It's just, you know, it's on me. I've got to figure out how to do this. So that's probably taken me six months, but I've really got a bit between my teeth now. And uh, from where every time we've had a bit of adversity in our business, we, um, you know, that when we were giving land away to Canterbury, it was like, no, bugger this, so we're going to put those in. Um, when we got our ass kicked with a, a low reproduction rate in our cows, it was like, no, bugger this, it's our heifers. We're going to put fodder meat in and grow out a decent replacement. Or, um, you know, when we got, got our ass kicked with a, a dry autumn, it's, well, how do you mitigate that? Well, freezing balls do a really good job. And, and um, we, every time we've ended up with a better business, as well, well not, not just a business, we've been, ended up with a better better life balance or, you know, it's it, it been more, yeah, we've got more, for, it's been more fulfilling. So, um, yeah, it just mindset. I think you just got to hit your head around it that you're going to have to rise to the challenge, get the, you know, and um, shit, you know. I'm, what I'm really looking forward to out of this challenge is I've, I've gone through how much it costs to put winter crop in. Uh, no one likes shifting winter breaks, and I'm going, well, shit, if there's an opportunity here, I can cut back in here winter cropping. Uh, maybe cut some of that marginal cost. We've probably been running a few extra stock units and a bit of extra business in there. Um, here's, uh, here's another one for you, um, the Pareto effect, that... Um, 80% of your output is a result of 20% of your input. Now, that's not to say that 80%, the other 80% is not important, but um, and that comes from a neighbour. Um, so just, it's a real good chance to reassess what you're doing and what actually drives value in your business. So, yeah, I don't know. That's just, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome, Matt. I mean, it's such a great you know, takeaway there is actually the opportunity that comes out of adversity is actually that shift in mindset and that empowerment you gain from the skills learnt during tough times. So thank you so much to all of our panellists. Pat has had to jump off because he had a team meeting for um, hockey. So, but he wanted to thank everyone for their time this evening and hope that it's been of value. Um, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you, Justine. You've added so much to the conversation this evening. Um, I just wanted to briefly summarise some of the key things I jotted down during the talk, which was, um, you know, Matt, you said something good always comes out of adversity. And I love that. Um, it may be tough at the time, but something good will come out of it. Um, Justine, you're, I guess, making small decisions early to reduce the size of decisions that you have to make was a real key point for me. And Pat mentioned there about the one to two percent effects that are cumulative and working on both the expenses and the income lines to make those cumulative changes. Um, so yeah, there's some of the key take homes that I had. And I just want to thank everybody for coming along this evening and attending actually. There's a, a cracker number of you all here and I hope that this has been of value to you. And I want to thank the Beef and Lamb team for putting this webinar series on because I know I'll be going back and watching the recording because I could not write fast enough all of those take-home messages. Um, it's been a huge value to me even as the panel host. So thank you very much. And I will now hand over to Kristen to do the wrap-up. Thanks, Bex. Um, I just want to say a huge big thank you to our panel for your honesty and your sharing and being part of our, um, our, our wonderful webinar series that we've been all so excited to work together on. Um, Olivia has popped in the chat for those of you that have joined us tonight, um, some Knowledge Hub links and also uh, 
contact details for your extension managers. So we're all here in the background. If you need us, touch base, want to chat about anything, um, that's our job. So people, we will look forward to seeing you all back here next Monday for webinar two, where we tackle budgets and using cash flow monitoring to find opportunities with accountant Fraser Ware. Thank you, everyone.